Welcome to People and Profit. I'm Kate Moody. Coming up, the road to parity has gotten longer. The pandemic and a weak economic recovery have pushed back progress on closing the gender gap around the world. School districts in the U.S. are hoping to combat a shortage of teachers by offering affordable housing, but not necessarily higher salaries. And are you ready to replace stamps with barcodes? France's post office is preparing to go digital. We will not see gender parity in our lifetimes, and the wait is getting longer. That's the sober warning from the World Economic Forum's latest research. It says at the current rate of progress, the global gender gap won't be closed for 132 years. That's a slight improvement on last year's 136-year estimate, but far longer than the 99 and a half years that had been predicted before the pandemic. Only one in five countries made significant progress towards parity over the last year. Scandinavian countries once again topped the rankings, with Iceland, Finland, Norway and Sweden dominating the top five. France was ranked 15th in the world, the UK and US both lower. Let's speak to Sadia Zahidi, Managing Director at the World Economic Forum. Thanks for being with us today. Now, your latest report is projecting it will take more than a century to achieve gender parity around the world. How is that calculated? What factors are at play there? So we look at four different dimensions of gender equality, um, health, education, economic participation, and political empowerment. And it's been a decade and a half that we have been tracking these indicators in one combined global gender gap index. And um, two years ago, before the pandemic, the data was showing us that it would take roughly 100 years to get to gender parity. Now, that's certainly not good enough and certainly not in any of our lifetimes. But what has happened over the course of the last two and a half years is that things have slowed down even more. And now the rate of change is so slow that it would take 132 years to get to parity. So a couple of additional generations got added when looking at gender gaps this way for the whole world. And talk us through how the pandemic specifically has impacted that. So there's a number of different things happening. I, I think one aspect is that as... Um, schools shut down as um, care-related re responsibilities um, fell to women more than men, some of that um, approach has become ossified. So even as schools have reopened, women have ended up continuing to take on more of the caregiving responsibility than they were doing before. And it was already very unequal with um, men spending about um, three times less of the amount of time on unpaid work as compared to men, even before the pandemic. And now what has happened is that it's become even bigger and uh, the amount of time that women are having to spend versus men, and that seems to have become stuck. So the lack of care infrastructure overall has ended up being disproportionately bad for women. The second element is, all of our uh, economies have become so much more digitized than they were before. And much of that future growth that is going to be happening in certain job sectors that are high tech, high skilled, high wage, tend to not be the sectors or tend to not be the job roles in which many more women than men go in. So um, the number of STEM degrees, science, technology, engineering, math, Unfortunately, these are still disproportionately um, higher numbers of men than women. And so the pipeline of talent that is going into these sectors is less than um, men. And then the third element is the sectors that have been the most disrupted over the course of the pandemic, travel and tourism, um, retail. These are not sectors that have bounced back in the same way as some of the others that have continued to grow or have stayed the same. And these happen to be very big employers of women. And that is where some of the biggest job losses have happened. And it's very clear that the recovery for women has not been the same as the recovery for men. This is a recession or a, a set of um, economic slowdown over the last couple of years that has been worse for women than men. Most economies around the world are now dealing with a cost of living crisis, and your report suggests that once again, that's having a bigger impact on women. Yeah, and again, part of that is because women have suffered more losses to their income and to their jobs than men. But part of it is also structurally 
to begin with, if we don't even think about the last two years, but structurally to begin with, women happen to be in lower paid professions or even in the same job, they tend to be lower paid than men. And this is a pattern that exists around the world. It's worse in some countries, better in other countries, but overall this pattern continues to persist. And so when you are in a situation where prices are rising, there is an overall cost of living crisis, it is women workers that are going to end up suffering more than men. Time and time again, we see Scandinavian countries coming out on the top of these sorts of rankings. Talk us through what specific policies they have that other economies don't. You know, it's mostly the patterns that I have just described. It's the reverse of these patterns that tend to hold true in a lot of Nordic economies. Now, one thing I will say, one caveat, the highest ranking country in the world, Iceland, while it has continued to outperform itself, it still hasn't closed its gender gap. It's closed 90% of the gender gap in the way that we measure it. So even the Scandinavian countries have some way to go, but they do have in place a care infrastructure. There is reskilling and upskilling support for those that are disrupted in certain sectors. They have the support to move into other roles and that targets women in declining sectors as much as it does men. Um, and third, there is a lot of support available um, at times of crisis um, when, when there is, for example, a crunch when it comes to inflation. So there are these types of support. And then most importantly, overall, the growth in these economies is very dependent on human capital as a whole, on talent, on highly skilled talent, and on ensuring that there is a readiness for the future and for the growing sectors of the future. And they tend to also have a smaller gender gap when it comes to education in some of those sectors that are growing in the future. And final point, the sectors that tend to employ a lot of women, um, care sector, health sector, education sector, these are sectors that are valued through better wages, better working conditions in these economies as compared to other parts of the world where they are undervalued, tend to be seen as essential work during a crisis, but tend to be forgotten during other times of, um, of, of the year. So from the top, let's go all the way to the bottom of your global ranking and talk specifically about Afghanistan. Uh, to what degree has the Taliban takeover in the last year affected not just parity, but women's rights and women's lives there? Yeah, so Afghanistan comes out 146 in the rankings, the lowest ranking country um, in the entire report, having closed less than 50% of the gender gap. Now, there is a lag in the data. Um, I think it would be hard to say how much of this is because of the specific regime that is now in place versus the regime that was in place before. But some of these are long-standing structural problems when it comes to basic access to health for women, education for women, um, access in the labor force, and certainly access in terms of political decision making. But it is very clear from some of the policies that have been put in place that I think we can all see when it comes, for example, to secondary education for girls, even if some of that is not yet showing in the data, it will absolutely show up in the data in the future. And given how low the country is already performing, things will go backward further if action isn't taken. Now, there are obviously a lot of different policies that are involved in these calculations, but I want to ask what the number one thing that countries uh, or perhaps even companies or the private sector can do to really make progress towards closing this gender gap. So care is a massive piece, and in particular for um, countries where there has already been uh, a, a set of investments on getting women into the labor force, uh, then there also needs to be a care infrastructure. And that requires not just government investments, but also businesses need to provide the kind of environment where people can um, balance work and family life. But a second element is better planning for the future. We know what is going to be the future of jobs. We know what are the skill sets that are required in the future. There needs to be a much more strategic focus overall for ensuring that workers are able to move from those declining sectors to those growing sectors. But within that, there has to be a gender lens. Otherwise, we are looking at losing the gains that have happened in the last two or three decades. Sadia Zahidi, thank you so much for joining us on People in Profit today. Next, America's education system is facing a shortage of teachers. 
With relatively low pay and tough working conditions, especially since the start of the pandemic, it's a profession that many are now reconsidering. In an effort to retain current staff members and attract new ones, some school districts are building affordable housing communities specifically for teachers. Leo McGuinn reports. This block of modern apartments just south of San Francisco is home exclusively to teachers and staff of the local school district. In May last year, the Jefferson Union High School District opened 122 apartments, available to rent for employees at a heavily discounted rate. A move which has meant teachers like Lisa are able to afford their own place. I don't know why they didn't do it sooner. Um, I think more schools really need to consider doing this or more districts really need to consider this model. Um, I think it shows educators that they value them as educators. I think that this is a good way to retain those educators. Retaining educators across the country has proved an increasingly difficult task. More than half of educators now say that they're considering leaving their jobs early, up nearly 20% in just six months. Which is why Jefferson Union High School District has become one of the handful of places across the US that offers educator housing. We've had significant turnover of staff over the years, 25% on an annual basis. And, um, and this is a way for us to be able to retain and recruit both teachers and staff. Teachers' salaries have stayed largely the same, while house prices have continued to rise, making it difficult to find affordable housing. In 2012, 34 percent of homes across the U.S. were affordable on a teacher's salary. By 2016, that number had almost halved to 20 percent. In California, it's even worse, 17 percent compared to 30 four years previous. Under the current agreement, Jefferson School District tenants can stay up to five years in one of these purpose-built apartments. Sending a letter is a time-honored tradition, which in France is getting a 21st century upgrade. More than 170 years after the first postage stamps were issued, French post offices will soon begin selling barcodes that can be handwritten on envelopes instead of a sticker. Alison Sargent's got mail. They come in several colors, featuring the profile of French symbol the Marianne, but their days may be numbered. Starting next year, France's Postal Service will also be selling eight character codes to copy by hand onto envelopes. Could it bring back a certain part of the population that had stopped sending letters? We hope so. But that's not the goal of this new digital stamp. Before France launched its first stamps in 1849, it was the person on the receiving end who had to pay. Since then, Marianne has seen a series of artistic makeovers. When you need to be licked by so many people, you can't be too odd-looking. People shouldn't be licking you with disgust. During the 20th century, the arrival of the postman was a much-awaited event. Each letter bearing the mark of a faraway place, a cultural treasure collectors find well worth keeping. It's like traveling without leaving home. You can learn so many things, get interested in so many topics, major discoveries, literature, it's unending. Today, people in France send three times less mail than they did 15 years ago. And when they mention stamps, it's usually to complain about the rising price. But are they really ready to go digital? I'm old fashioned, it's too complicated. There are already electronic stamps for passports, so we're used to it. We're adapting slowly. I'm 63. I'm not ready for this thing. I've had it with codes. I can't take it. The digital code will be an experiment alongside old-fashioned stamps, which for now are sticking around. Well, that's all for this week. Don't forget you can catch this and our previous shows on our website, or as a podcast wherever you usually listen. You can also get in touch with your comments and questions on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching.